And welcome to Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future, brought to you by the Kauai Foundation. I'm Ahu Kekahu Cardwell, and here we are today on the beautiful island of Oahu, out by Kahala. We have a great guest on our show today, so let's come on over here and meet him. John, aloha. Hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Great to see you. John Kamakaviva Ole Osorio. Hello. And John, tell us a little bit about yourself. You are a professor mm -hmm. at University of Hawaii, Center for Hawaiian Studies. That's right, so far. So far. <laughs> You actually ran that. You were chair of it for a while. I was you? chair of it for almost five years. Yeah. Great, great. And what uh, what do you what do you professor of? What uh, what studies there? Well, um, I'm a professor of Hawaiian studies. I'm a historian. My PhD is in history from the University of Hawaii. And what I mostly teach is 19th century kingdom law, music, a variety of other subjects, uh, indigenous methodologies of research, uh, literature and Mo'olelo Oivi, so uh, my specialty really is is the history and mostly 19th century things. Things that happen in Hawaii in the 19th century. In, in the kingdom. In the kingdom, in the Hawaiian kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as a matter of fact, you wrote a book called Dismembering Lahui, Lahui yeah, being the Hawaiian word for nation, right. about what happened at the time of the, the just prior to the overthrow, yes? Right. <clears throat> took the uh, history of the kingdom from its constitutional beginnings to its unconstitutional uh, dismemberment in 1887 uh, uh, prior to the overthrow of the Queen. Yeah. Yes, and meaning that now the, the kingdom is illegally overthrown, is illegally occupied rather, by the United States. Has been, yes. Um, certainly pretty officially occupied by the United States since 1898. So if I got my math right, that's about uh, 117 years. That's a long time. And counting. Yes, yeah. it is. Okay, so it was a, 117 years ago, it was a takeover that is still still uh, going on today. Right. And the takeover was, of course, of the, 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 the land. Well, it was, it was a takeover of the kingdom's administration. It was, um, first you have in 1993 the American-supported puppet regime, the, P the provisional government and... 1893. Uh, 1893. Um, yes. The provisional government and the, and the republic. And, and at the time, one of the most significant things that took place was that the provisional government assumed control of and began to proclaim its ownership over um, probably about two million acres of, of the government lands of the kingdom and the crown lands belonging to the, the reigning monarch, who at that time was the Liuo Kalani. Right, so mm -hmm. if you look at all the land mass in Hawaii, it's about double that, isn't it? About four million about acres. About four million acres. So what you're talking about is half of the land mass in Hawaii. Half of the land mass. Um, and so those amount. lands were taken, and to this day they've never been returned. That's true. They have not been returned. They have been, um, they have been used instead for mostly for federal projects um, right up until 1959. The United States government um, basically helped itself to whatever lands it needed, mostly for military bases, um, a lot of them on this island, um, national parks and that sort of thing. Um, but it also did, you know, to give it its due, it did set aside 205,000 acres uh, for the Hawaiian, um, Hawaiian Homes um, initiative in 1921. Um, Hawaiian Homes. Yeah, Homestead. homelands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, it it did do that. Uh, so, you know, uh, <laughs> it has, at at least in part, um, acted as a a trustee for those lands. As a bad landlord. That's right. <laughs> but, because I mean, what you're talking about, John, is really ten percent, two hundred thousand acres of two point two million acres. Yeah. And that 10% is some of the worst land. It's upland, it's not developed. It it's was it was selected out by, um, by territorial carefully. leaders who yes. were not particularly interested in, in making sure that Hawaiians were going to thrive on these lands. Yeah. What the government did in, in, in between 1846 and 1850 is it created not just private property, but it absolutely, it, it created this, you know, um, this tenure of land that the government would have control over, the government lands. And it, it also created the property of, of the sovereign Koi Kia'uli and his descendants or his heirs. Uh, so all of this, I mean, they basically created property under law, under Hawaiian kingdom law. Law that was as valid as any other laws passed by any other countries in the 19th century. 
uh, laws that were valid because, first of all, uh, in the Western sense it has val validity, because it was done constitutionally. It came out of a constitutional uh, creation in 1840 of the kingdom. It came from the legislature, which was duly constituted. It came from the power of the king, which was also um, duly constituted. By Western, by Western examination and, and, and vision, there was nothing. Um, there was nothing about the Mahele that was uh, less than completely legal. So, in other words, what you're saying is, no matter which laws you applied, whether it's Hawaiian Kingdom laws mm -hmm. or Western laws, it was all valid. It was all. It was all valid. Yeah, and it continues to be valid until the moment that the provisional government seizes those lands. Um, and then, over the course of time, hands it over to the United States. That's where you see no legal validity. So, who has those lands today? Well, the federal government, the United States government, continues to, to occupy large amounts of the ceded lands. We're not really, really sure, because we don't know exactly how much, we think about 2.2 million acres was conveyed. Um, we're not really sure what the state has at this point because the state doesn't know. So in other words, uh, uh, an inventory has never been done? An inventory has never been done in the ceded lands. It's one of the, the biggest failures of, of the state government, really, um, because it has a fiduciary responsibility for those. It has a, actually a trust obligation um, to, you know, even by, by, West, even by American um, pronouncements, it has a trust obligation to the, whole, to the public, right, right, and to the Native Hawaiians. And that's fairly clear in the 1959 um, document that supposedly make it, made us a state. The state, therefore, it, because the state has been, this land has been transferred to its control, and because it exists basically for the benefit of the general public and the Native Hawaiians, the state is responsible for knowing exactly what its lands are and how, and, and it is responsible for managing them correctly. The federal government, meanwhile, feels, apparently feels no such responsibility because, you know, they use their, the lands that they, they're occupying are mostly in, in American military bases. And what the, what the, the military bases have done to really foul those lands, um, all you have to do is talk to Pat, Pat Tummins or any of the environmentalists who've been doing this kind of study for years, and it is absolutely criminal. Uh, toxic, um, toxic substances that are left unclean, toxic sites that get into the aquifer. Um, the federal government's actual mismanagement of those lands and using them for military bases has been a, a horrid kind of um, commentary on you know, and, and just completely the opposite of what Hawaiians have traditionally done to care for Aina. The state, on the other hand, is, is, is guilty more of, of neg negligence and, I think, absolute laziness. Um, and, and, and the problem with the state is they inherited these lands, and the state itself, the, the, the government, the state government, has very little land of its own. I remember uh, legitimate land, of legitimate land yeah. of its own. I remember talking to some DLNR folks back in 1995 who said, you know, um, of of the hundred percent of the land that the state controls, uh, it, it only owns about seven percent. You know, legitimately has real. Title you said to this it. to folks at Department of Land and Natural yeah. Resources. Yeah, that's right. The yeah, guys yeah. that yeah, yeah. the landlords. <clears throat> right. Yeah, and 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 they were basically telling me, you know, um, that's why this land trust is so important to the state. The state would have a very, very, very difficult time operating and continuing if it didn't have the revenues of the ceded lands. Sure. And you know, uh, you know, that's that's something that sounds quite reasonable. And then you start realizing, well, what is it the state actually does with the ceded lands? Yeah. And and you start to understand that it, it uses it. Um, they, they use them for lots of different things, but managing them, knowing what they're actually worth, going out and actually finding the best possible investments in those lands. The state doesn't really do that. They do none of that stuff. They do right? none of that stuff. Yeah. They basically wait for people to come to them and say, you know, uh, gee, you know, can I lease can I lease these lands for, you know, ten or fifteen dollars right. an acre? How much a year? you willing to give us, baby? <laughs> right. And or So can, again, bad bad landlords. It, it really they really are extremely bad landlords. Yeah. They could conceivably make um, a good deal more money on the management of the lands if they put more effort into it. But there's another part about this, and this is that the territory and the territorial government always behaved sort of linking arms with big major land 
owners in Hawaii with a castle and boats. With big business. And seabirds. Yes, they, they always did this. And, 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 and their policies and their, and their land use, um, and the, their land use policies were always sort of geared at making sure that they were well taken care of. Sure. And they figured as long as the big plantations were taken care of, because they employed all these people, right, that, that basically the territory was going to be solvent. The state has pretty much taken up the same kind of uh, a position ever since the 1960s. And even though these big co corporations don't employ the same numbers of people in uh, in, in agribusiness, in, in sugar or pineapple. In fact, they, they employ hardly anybody in those. Yeah, those are gone. They're still given tremendous kinds of, uh, of opportunities and good looks uh, by the state who can still, who still treat them as though they cannot be trifled with or messed with. You know what it sounds to me like all along, John, is nothing but a bunch of short-term thinking and no long-term planning at all. Once, once you get through the big blush of major construction and people start wondering, what, you know, where can we build next, we find ourselves in trouble. We find yeah. ourselves really in trouble because it certainly appear, appears as though the tourist industry has maxed itself out at around six to seven million you know, visitors yeah. a year. People aren't spending that much anymore. And now you're thinking, okay, where is the money and the investment going to come from? And the only thing that the state can, can think of doing now is selling land. Selling land. And that's what they're doing. Exactly. That's what they're so doing. that brings us to now. Right. And that brings us to you because you were one of four individuals who actually uh, brought suit uh, about right. the ceded lands, didn't you? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Explain that to our viewers because this is really quite, quite a story. Back in 1994, um, there were four Four of us, and then later on, the um, um, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs jumped in. Yep. Um, the original plaintiffs were basically four individuals working with two attorneys um, at that time, Kavika Liu and um, and uh, Meheula. Bill. Bill Meheula. And you know what we were trying to do was, I mean, the proximate the proximate complaint was this development that the state was entering into with the folks over uh, some property in Leili. And it, it, and it basically exchanged, it involved the, the, the selling of this, this property, which were ceded lands, to this development company in exchange, for, um, in exchange for the provision that some of the development would be done in low cost or middle cost housing. Okay, but wait, wait, wait. The state had no right to sell those ceded lands, no, did they? No, they, they, they really didn't have the right to sell the lands, but you know, the truth is, that ceded lands have been sold before and always sort of um, under the cover of general ignorance. People really didn't know what those lands were. People because didn't really. There'd been, uh, no there'd been no now inventory. There'd been no inventory. There'd been no inventory. There'd been no inventory, so people didn't exactly know which lands were ceded lands right. and which ones were. But but I, I also will tell you that before 1993, there was a general ignorance anyway. Uh, actually, I should say before eight, 1987, there was a general ignorance anyway about ceded lands. Um, Kalahui Hawaii was like the first basic organization to come around and say, we, we know what ceded lands are. Those are crown and government lands that the federal government yeah. has held that, you know, and, and so for, really for the first time people are actually talking about this in the late 80s and early 90s. And the state is doing this kind of monkey business in the early, in the early 90s. And what we were trying to do was put a stop to that. So in other words, you saw that they were selling and trading away ceded lands right. and you said, nope. We got to yeah. put a stop to that that's because right. that stolen land, that's our land. That's right. And we have a claim to and it. We have a claim to it, and at, and at a minimum, as long as long as they have the stolen lands, they need to keep them and hold on to them. Right. Until we can get them back. Until we can get them back. Until something is negotiated. Right. But certainly, you know, if 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 the state is allowed to basically exchange or sell them away, um, and and we're basically left with nothing at at the very end, if the, if and when there is a settlement with the Hawaiian people or with the Hawaiian nation, um, they could all be gone. <clears throat> it finally got down to the point mm -hmm. where things started to happen again, right? Yeah, in the, um, in the lower court, um, Judge this McKenna is, had- This is like a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, several years ago. The, the, Judge McKenna um, ruled basically in, in favor of the defendants. That was overturned by the, the Hawaii Supreme Court um, on appeal. So Judge McKenna uh, ruled in favor of you guys? No, Judge McKenna ruled in favor of the of the defendants. The state? Of the state. Of the state. Aha. Uh -huh. okay. And um, 
when that was overturned by the Supreme Court, the Hawaii, Hawaii Supreme, Supreme, Supreme Court, Court, we were just ecstatic. Right. Because the Hawaii Supreme Court made no bones about it. I mean, basically, they, they issued an injunction. There could be no sale of ceded lands, or no, ex you know, there could be no sale or exchange of ceded lands um, until, un until the process of reconciliation that had been called for by the, 18, by the 1993 apology law had, 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 had basically been, um, we, until we had gotten into some kind of reconciliation. In other words, in some way or another, the, the Hawaii Supreme Court was saying, you ha the, the Hawaiian people have a claim, right? Yep. Hawaiian people have a claim and something must be done um, to move us along in that direction uh, or else this injunction is going to stand. So you guys had to be standing there going, Oh my goodness, yeah. they get it. Yes. They get it. Absolutely. We were absolutely thrilled uh, with that decision and in, in, in the same way we were, we were really horrified when we heard that this was going to go, that, that the Attorney General was going to appeal this to the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, I really believed that we had the attorney, um, Bill Meheula, that could win this one. Mm. I thought that, that, that if, if he were to make the argument um, Independent nation state, where is where is where are the legal grounds for the taking of our national sovereignty and the taking of our lands? Um, I felt that if he made that argument before the U.S. Supreme Court, it would it, even if we didn't prevail, it would be a tremendous it would be a tremendous thing. It would have opened up the Pandora's box. Right. Yeah, and um, you know he he did not agree that the. Our attorneys took the, the safest possible route. They believed that if um, they believed that if the, the U.S. Supreme Court actually began to discuss Newland's resolution, that it was possible that they, that in fact they believed that it was likely that the U.S. Supreme Court would actually actually declare that the Hawaiians have no claim. That they would reaffirm the Newland's uh, right. resolution as valid, and then there's another layer right. to have to break through. Okay, so. So it went to the U.S. Supreme Court, the big day arrived, and what happened? Well, you know, um, what actually happened was what some people predicted might happen. Um, the, the U.S. Supreme Court kicked it back down to the state, to the um, Hawaii Supreme Court, and said, you know what, you really can't use the 1893 you know, apology law because it's, it's just a resolution. <laughs> so, by the way, is the Newlands resolution. Right, exactly. But, uh, you know, it doesn't have the force of the law. It, it, there, there is nothing about it that, that, that requires, that, that calls any kind of requirement of action. It's just an apology. So, you were, you were improper to list this as a basis for your decision. In other words, you didn't do your homework. Right. And you know what? The fact that they kicked it back down, I, I, and I do believe all the plaintiffs understood this immediately. Go back into the, to, to, to the Supreme Court and say, you've got more than enough without apology law. You, you have basically trust law. You know, yeah. you, you have, the, the, you know, all the other things that you've said, that, that, that the state of Hawaii has a trust obligation over these lands and that it, it is in a position of needing to require, you know, to observe great care in how it handles these lands as long as there's a Hawaiian, a, you know, a Hawaiian claim out there. Yeah. You, you can still reaffirm the injunction. And I was astonished when our attorney said, you know, I think we've got a deal with the legislature. And the legislature is going to agree to, you know, the legislature is going to agree to, to require a two-thirds majority vote in order to sell ceded lands, and as long as we drop the suit. And I knew when he told me this that something terrible had happened. So it basically came down, there were four guys, and the other three dropped away. So then it came down to one guy, only one person left on this entire planet between the state being able to sell the, the ceded lands or not, and that person was you, yes? Right. And uh, what did you do? I told my attorney that I was going to remain uh, a plaintiff in this case and that I would find um, other representation if he wasn't going to represent me in this. And, in other words, uh, you said, no, I'm not going to acquiesce, right. I'm not selling out, I will continue to, if it means being the only person on the planet, I will stand right. here and keep the state from selling the seated lands. Right. Wow. Wow. Well, it, it, you know, <laughs> wow, except that the, the state Supreme Court, uh, the, the Hawaii Supreme Court, shortly thereafter, not that shortly, but several months thereafter, dismissed me as, as a plaintiff as well. And there, 
their basic appeal to the to the Hawaii Supreme Court is that I had no standing because I was not a 50% blood quantum Hawaiian, and that under uh, that the state constitution uh, or, or that is the Admissions Act only really required the state to acknowledge 50 percenters. The irony of of someone who has uh, of someone who has really really dedicated my life to, to trying to figure out what it means to be Hawaiian in in the 20, 20th and 21st century, um, being told, you know, your blood quantum defines you. Uh, the ir irony of the fact that that in in our studies, I mean, this is the most racist kind of, 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 of attack on, on any people, that you can basically have a government agency or anybody tell somebody who they are based on some kind of um, completely uh, ridiculous computation of blood. Arbitrary pulled out of the air, yeah. yeah. But of all Very people, arbitrary. you, somebody who's dedicated your life to this, you teach this at the university, you have researched this, you've written books on this, and then some guy who knows nothing about this right. comes in out of, you know, foreigner comes in and says, well, sorry, John, you're not Hawaiian. Unbelievable. You know, and I, after a while, I stopped taking it personally. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, and I, I realized, you're a better man than me. Let me I, tell you I, right I realized <laughs> that this was, you know, this was, in fact, um, the ploy of really, really desperate people. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. The ploy of desperate people. So what happens next? I mean, what, what's, your, what's, your mono, what's your point of view about what should happen? I think we need to go back to court, and I think we need to go back to, to, to the Hawaii courts and say, the remedy that you said was in place is no remedy. That the state, in fact, is proceeding to sell ceded lands, and, and, and in fact, we've seen this year alone, um, and, and, and really, just months after the state had passed its, you know, its, its own law limiting uh, its ability, supposedly limiting its ability to sell ceded lands, it comes up with this huge scheme that, was, that, that came up before the House Finance Committee that would have allowed the state to sell off large, large portions, actually sell off specific ceded lands for um, somewhere between half a billion to three quarters of a billion dollars. Wait, and the, billions? Billion, yes. Billions. Yeah. Okay. And, and this was essentially to rescue the state's current financial crisis. Oh, my right. God. And, and oh. part of the thing that they were going to sell off was pretty much the top of Mauna Kea, Woo. where you have all those, you have all of those you know, telescopes. Yes. A those multi-million dollar telescopes yes. that have been problematic from the beginning because you have Native Hawaiian, you know, um, Native Hawaiian sensitive. Pr practitioners who really object to their presence there. Okay, they're there. The state is basically saying, let's make it somebody else's problem. We're tired of managing this. You know, we have control over these lands. They could conceivably generate a good deal of income, but it's going to be really tough for us to sell this to the Native Hawaiian community, you know, as these leases, the present leases, which are a dollar a year leases. Wait a minute, they pay a dollar a A dollar year? a year oh, leases for these telescopes. The present leases, when they expire, and they'll be expiring over the next 10 years or so, some, some less than that, uh, it's just going to be too difficult for us to figure out how much to charge them because we're still going to have to deal with the Native Hawaiians who object to them in the first place. In other words, it's a really difficult management problem and the state doesn't want to do it. What they want to do is sell them and, and be done with it. Take the money, you know, basically rescue their sorry, sorry budget. Yes. And they do it in the easiest, least, uh, least well, the least difficult way they can More possibly do it. It is absolutely. And, and we, you know, the way I have to take this is, look, show me, have the state of Hawaii show me that they can manage this as, as well as the Konahiki, uh, you know, of the, of the 18th and the 17th and the 16th centuries. As well as the Hawaiians. They, they can't show you they, that. They can't show you no. that. They don't know the lands. They don't know its value. They don't know its worth. They don't know how to deal with the people who live on them. Right. They're refusing to do this. The law that, the, the, the law that they passed that, that, uh, required a two-thirds majority vote to sell ceded lands, also requires a two-thirds majority vote to prevent the exchange of lands. <laughs> Don't you love it? So that means that they can exchange lands as much as they want, and it's going to be very difficult to prevent them. If you, if you exchange 300 acres of land for one acre, and, and, and by the way, they've already done this several times, 
200 acres here for, for a half acre or an acre and a half. They've already, at, at, at that rate, you can basically dispose of much of our lands and leave the Hawaiian people with basically, I don't know, um, we, should, we should do the math, but probably less than, less than a thousand acres of industrial property. Yeah, but this is like for every penny you give me, I give you a dollar. Yeah. I um, mean, how long can that go on? It can go on as long as the state is allowed to sell or exchange ceded lands. And this is exactly why the, the states, the, the, the Hawaii Supreme Court has, has to reassert itself yeah. and tell the state not to do this. John, we've got to wrap up. But in closing, mahalo, thank you very much for what you've done standing up on behalf of all, not only Native Hawaiians, but all the people of Hawaii, all the people all over the world that love Hawaii, that don't want this to happen. They really don't, and if they, if they really think about it, nobody should want this to happen. Nobody should want this to happen. Exactly, exactly. Please keep fighting, as I know you will. I will. Please keep going. Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth, one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. I'm Ehuke Kahu Cardwell. Remember, you can watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. And until next time, ahui ho. Mahalo for watching Voices of Truth one-on-one -on -one with Hawaii's future. Watch us on the web 24-7 at VoicesOfTruthTV.com. You'll find all our shows, including this one, in case you want to see it again or share it with family and friends. Also view our weekly video commentaries at FreeHawaiiTV.com. And check out our blog, published daily, at FreeHawaii.info. It's all part of the Free Hawaii Broadcasting Network.